Thank you, Peter. Uh, I, I have to say this is, I was not expecting a room as full as this, so thank you all for making me feel good about myself. <laughs> Comparing myself to a Saturday evening in Montreal, I mean, you chose me, and, and you're going to listen to the very exciting topic of blood pressure. Uh, I am, I'm really honored. Thank you. Thank you for being here. And doors are locked, as he yes. says, so people can't leave even if they're bored. <laughs> All right, so uh, we're going to talk about some numbers, and, and you know, I, I really don't know if there is a magic number, but uh, I'll hopefully present you some numbers, some numbers you'll agree with, some numbers you won't, you, you'll argue with. Uh, but in, in the end, I hope that this will just raise awareness about the problem of intraoperative, perioperative hypotension, and really as anesthesiologists, intensivists, make us more cognizant and really make us focus on what we can do to improve outcomes for our patients throughout their journey from the operating room to, to the ICU. Some of my uh, financial disclosures, uh, none of which is a conflict of interest with the educational material on these slides today. All right, so right at the outside, I'd like to state that arterial hypotension or a low blood pressure number literally means nothing in itself. You know, that isolated number, 60, 55, 70, whatever it is, uh, it has to, as much as possible, be taken in context of the duration of exposure or an area under the curve. So the amount and duration of hypotension make sense, but numbers in isolation probably don't make as much clinical or statistical sense. And most of the work that we've been trying to do or we should be trying to do in future should truly focus on the amount and duration rather than singular numbers. I will start us off or I will start us off with a patient that we take to the operating room and then to the floor and bring back to the ICU and see what we do during this um, blood pressure journey. So hypotension in the operating room, all of you are, should be or could be uh, familiar with this uh, fairly landmark work that was done by Walsh, uh, Sessler, and colleagues, published in 2013 in anesthesiology, truly defined a map of 65, both for acute kidney injury and myocardial injury as the threshold where harm starts. This is about uh, 30,000 plus non-cardiac surgical patients at Cleveland Clinic. And truly, the, the paper was titled Towards an Empirical Def Definition of Hypotension. And I would agree that th this helped us define hypotension in empirical terms in the intraoperative environment. What the authors for further did, and that goes back to my point of the amount and duration, they were able to define damage associated with time. So a full minute of exposure to hypotensive thresholds of a map less than 55 significantly increased harm risk associated with any cardiac complication, myocardial injury, and acute kidney injury. And this is intraoperative exposure. Now, considering most surgeries last anywhere from two hours to four hours, you would really cringe at what is happening once we don't respond to hypotension intraoperatively. Once exposure exceeds about 20 minutes or so, then we're looking at twice the increased risk of organ system injury. Certainly, these are numbers that cannot and should not be ignored. I see uh, Dr. Masha in the crowd here, and he, is, he actually replicated this work, 100,000 patients, again, non-cardiac surgical patients at Cleveland Clinic, and similar thresholds once more, this time a map around 70, was associated with 30-day mortality, whether taken as a time-weighted average or a duration exposure of 10 minutes or more. And then the all important question, your patient comes to the operating room and he or she is chronically hypertensive. Do we need to adjust our thresholds? Based on the work done and published by Wafi Salmasi in 2016 in anesthesiology, we don't think we need to think differently for chronically hypertensive patients, at least simplistically in terms of numbers. We saw that harm associated with patients' 
looking at absolute numbers of hypotensive thresholds versus a relative reduction to 25% from baseline was nearly equal and same. So the panel A here shows cumulative low blood pressure thresholds in terms of lowest absolute map, and panel B shows a percent decrease from panel C here, or on the figure, but panel B here shows a absolute decrease from baseline. The behavior of risk is entirely the same, whether you look at myocardial injury or you look at acute kidney injury. Simplistically stated, as an anesthesiologist in the operating room, you can still take a MAP of 65 to be your threshold associated with harm. Yes, there is a lot of discussion and deliberation on chronic hypertension. I'm happy to answer those questions afterwards, but at least from what we saw or these investigators saw, no difference uh, whatsoever. I'll take a pause here and tell you that all of this work so far is large retrospective associative analysis. Even with the best adjustments of covariates, there is always hidden confounding. There had been no real robust RCT done in the intraoperative environment till the group from um, the in-press investigators led by Fuchsier published this work in JAMA in 2017. They randomized nearly 300 patients to two targets of blood pressures. One was a more individualized management, which was about 10% close to their baseline, that they uh, used norepinephrine to achieve that pressure intraoperatively. The other group was the group where they allowed blood pressure or didn't allow, but they intervened when systolic pressures dropped to 80 or less with ephedrine boluses to push pressure up. So they essentially compared individualized management versus standard of care. Standard of care was a systolic of 80 or less at which they intervened. It was an RCT, and the primary outcome here was a comp composite of systemic inflammation and organ system injury. The results were interesting in that they showed that the standardized management that is keeping the blood, uh, keeping the blood pressure, or allowing the blood, only intervening. I'm sorry, when the systolic dropped below 80, versus the individualized treatment, or keeping blood pressure as close to baseline as possible, was associated. The individualized arm did better than the standardized arm. Now, the, it, this is interesting because several of us will say that we'll probably not allow systolic blood pressures to drop to 80 or less before we intervene. So, you know, in, in most case scenarios, we would have probably reacted to systolic pressures about 100 before we tried to, uh, and that would probably be a good threshold for intervention. So, I definitely question that part of this work. The other part is their outcomes were interesting because their primary composite was largely driven by acute kidney injury and mental status changes. They had only one clinical myocardial infarction in the entire 292 randomized patients. Now that does make me worry about uh, the association of or the causality of different thresholds of hypotension and outcomes that seem to make difference or truly hard outcomes. Having said that, this is an RCT and I would say that the level of evidence is definitely stronger any day compared to the, the largest uh, you know, retrospective data set. So by and large, what do we take home from this RCT? Blood pressure seems to matter in the intraoperative environment. Best data that we know so far is still a map of 65. It looks like from what Fuchsier has done that we keep maps close to baseline. We seem to do better for our patients. The timing of hypotension is interesting. As anesthesiologists, we put our patients to sleep and then we're generally busy in the operating room. We're putting IVs, we're prepping and draping our patients, we're you know, putting a warming blanket on our patients. Next time you look around on the monitor, your pressure is probably 80 or 50, your propofol's now kicked in, and all of us will intervene at some stage, try and you know, correct the pressure. 
Now, it, this, this peri-induction hypotension seems critical. Uh, Maheshwari and colleagues published this work in anesthesia fairly recently, where they saw that of all MAP threshold readings less than 65, about 36% of them occurred in the period immediately after induction to the point of incision. And comparing induction to incision hypotension and incision to end of surgery hypotension, both of them were equally and independently associated with postoperative acute kidney injury. So while we cannot control what our friends, the surgeons do to uh, you know, put holes in blood vessels and drop blood pressure, we can certainly control what we do and probably do a better job at, at managing peri-induction hypotension because it seems to make a pretty significant difference in organ system injury. Again, a place where we can truly make a difference. What about tachycardia? Tachycardia seems to be, you know, generally intimately associated with hypotension. Um, you know, unless your patient's heavily beta blocked or has myocardial injury or myocardial depression from another cause. Now, mostly you would assume that tachycardia should make a difference in myocardial injury or mortality. The interesting thing that uh, these investigators saw that was that tachycardia just by itself seemed to not make too much of a difference when, it, when we looked at a primary composite of myocardial injury or mortality. Now, contrastingly, what Abbott and colleagues published was interesting because they looked at different thresholds of tachycardia and different thresholds of blood pressure, and at extremes of blood pressure, tachycardia seemed to make a difference when we looked at myocardial injury. Now, uh, truly, tachycardia, I would still say, uh, re seems to reasonably make a difference if it's prolonged and associated with, he with hemodynamic perturbations. Again, as perioperative physicians, it is incumbent on us to certainly control for that tachycardia uh, to, to allow our patients a safer uh, recovery. I would not take uh, tachycardia lightly. What about other components of blood pressure? So we've harped on MAP, and we've always talked about MAP, but MAP is probably not the only number that we're looking at. Uh, this is uh, fairly, um, uh, this, this data is as yet unpublished, and, and uh, again, I'm not going to go into huge details, but what has been seen, this is radial artery-derived blood pressure components, and uh, if you look at visual cut points of systolic blood pressure, MAP, diastolic blood pressure and lowest pulse, pulse pressure for a minimum of at least five minutes of exposure. All of these seem to make a difference. Systolic blood pressure threshold about 90, diastolic about 80, 45, MAP 65, and a pulse pressure of 35. What can be seen here is that diastolic blood pressure is slightly flat when we look at the predicted probability of myocardial injury compared to systolic and MAP. So simplistically speaking again, MAP and systolic blood pressure seem to be the bigger driving components when it comes to uh, various components of blood pressure that are associated with harm. Another way of looking at the same thing here looking at myocardial injury and acute kidney injury separately in the two panels. Again, uh, MAP and systolic blood pressure seem to have a more steeper slope when we look at uh, a standard deviation less than mean in both of the panels. So systolic of 90 and MAP of 65, we at least have some good numbers from the operating room. And at, at this point, <coughs> I, I am hoping that all of us have done a reasonably good job. We've kept our patient above a MAP of 65, above a systolic of 90, not allowed our patient to get unreasonably tachycardic for prolonged periods of time. At this point, you are dropping your patient off in the PACU. PACU is still a very well-monitored environment. Your patient has met discharge criteria from the PACU and is being sent to the floor. Most of us as anesthesiologists will probably, you know, go home at this point and say, okay, job's done, patients to the floor, things look okay. The issue is that our patients go to the floor or hospital wards, and while we believe that these are low acuity settings, that is not necessarily always the case. Now, based on 
our best knowledge, we do know that most myocardial infarctions occur, almost all of them occur postoperatively in the first one to three days. And when they do occur, they're mostly silent. And uh, silent myocardial injury is almost as, uh, as much associated with mortality as myocardial injury with clinical signs and symptoms. So you leave your patient to the floor, patient's being monitored only once in every four hours, that's where all the drama seems to occur, and that's where we're probably not intervening. Ward hypotension and hypoxemia, based on work that we have done so far, seems to be really, really common. And not only is it common, it is unprecedented, unpredictable, and fairly persistent. Postoperative 30 days after surgery, if taken as a disease entity, are only the third most common cause of death in the United States after disease of the, diseases of the heart and malignancies. So certainly not a period to be uh, taken uh, lightly at all. And if you look at the fraction of attributable mortality in the postoperative period, most of it, at least a fifth of it, is derived from myocardial injury. So we examined what happens to blood pressure on the floor. This work that was just recently published in anesthesiology is the result of continuous portable blood pressure monitoring of patients on the general care floor after non-cardiac surgery. And what we uncovered was really interesting. <clears throat> so if, if you looked at a threshold map of about 65 right here for 15 continuous minutes, about 20% of our patients were at a threshold map of 65 or less for 15 continuous minutes. Again, map of 70, the, those, those patients are about 30% right here. Now, the important part is that up to 50% of this hypotension was unnoticed and unrecorded based on standard snapshots in time, vital signs monitoring on the general care floor. So large chunks of hypotension was being missed. It gets more interesting in my next slide because contrary to popular belief, hypertension was at least as common and missed more commonly with intermittent monitoring on the general care floor. We looked at maps greater than 110, and again, exposure thresholds were similar but up to 70% of maps greater than 110 were missed based on continuous monitoring compared to snapshots in time, vital sign monitoring. Whether this hypertension is also associated with harm, I don't know as yet. I don't even know what thresholds of hypertension are associated with clear harm on the general care floor. But the reason I probably don't know it is that not much work has been done in this area. We don't even examine our patients' blood pressure very closely on the general care floor. So general care floor appears to be an environment where folks get MIs all the time. But again, there is no real scanner that looks at how and when and why these events happen. And ward hypertension matters. Some of you have read the results of the post hoc analysis of the POIS2 trial published uh, fairly recently. Dan Sessler again uh, elegantly demonstrates that hypotension, in fact, my next slide shows it better right here, hypotension on post op day one to four is associated with the risk of myocardial injury and or mortality, but looking at the amount of risk and comparing it with hypotension on post-op day zero or intraoperative hypotension, this risk is about three times as much as the same uh, outcomes associated with hypotension exposure intraoperatively for 10 or 30 minutes and or post-op day zero for 10 or 30 minutes. So again, I'll harp on the same point, Patients go to the floor, they die, they're probably hypotensive, they're missing these hypotensive events, and this harm is, appears to be way uh, stronger of an association compared to the intraoperative period. Let's bring our patient back to the ICU. I, I'm hoping that you know he or she is pr probably not crashed as yet, but still had a period of hypotension or hypertension. And as this lovely spaghetti of IV lines uh, shows you here, which a lot of us uh, have been um, very familiar with during our training days or otherwise, when you drop a patient to the ICU, especially from the operating room, 
ICU hyper, hypotension is never easy. I will talk about several associations of hypotension-associated harm in the critical care environment. I have to warn you and tell you that associations in the ICU will never be easy. Patients who are critically ill are dying of several other reasons, but just blood pressure changes. I do believe that, uh, and, uh, that uh, blood pressure is a significant uh, variable in the ICU, but I have to tell you that again, more needs to be done in the ICU as well, even before I start these slides. So what is an appropriate map in the ICU? Again, a lot of data from these studies from, right from the year 2000 up to 2014. You know, you can look at the numbers here, 10, 28, 11, 16, small numbers of patients. Not till as far as group in France published the work of the sepsis spam investigators did we ever have an RCT looking at blood pressure targets and ICU outcomes. And a lot of us uh, intensivists are familiar with this work. His low blood pressure target group was a map of 65 to 70. His high blood pressure target group was a map of 80 to 85. Kaplan-Meier curves tell you the story. There is no difference in 28-day or 90-day mortality. Now, there were um, several, uh, I wouldn't say entirely limitations, but, but side points to this trial. One of the major ones is blood pressure was overshot in each arm. So low blood pressure was actually 70 to 75. High blood pressure was 85 to 90. They did not look at myocardial injury, there was very few myocardial infarctions. Finally, there was also acute kidney injury, which was more common in the low blood pressure group, especially when patients had chronic hypertension to start off with. And there was more atrial arrhythmias in the high blood pressure group, which kind of deterred us from going towards higher blood pressures, at least based on this work. So a lot of interesting things that, that came from this trial, and truly the only landmark trial in this space, but um, is, is, it, is it the be all end all of how we manage blood pressure in the ICU? Like a lot of other things I've said today, probably not. The surviving sepsis guidelines are educating us for a map of 65, and I do believe that this is with this reasonable level of evidence. However, as this data here suggests, we are not doing a good job defending a map of 65. This is data from the MIMIC database that we presented last year. Exposure to blood pressure thresholds of 65, 60, and 55. When we looked at a time of exposure of at least two hours to up to four hours, about a two-third of patients were still under a map of 65, 37% were under 60, and 20% or, or thereabouts were less than 55. These are patients who are actively being resuscitated for septic shock and are on vasopressors for at least six hours before these numbers are generated. So despite knowing the guidelines and despite thinking that 65 is our threshold, we are not even there yet. And when that hypotension happens, as, 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 as you'd estimate, the mortality increases in all three thresholds pretty significantly, all the way up to 60 or 70 percent right here. Again, associative data, lots of com confounding, but a clear signal to harm when hypotension exposure increases in the ICU. There is a dollar sign associated with this uh, hypotension exposure as well, and this is a, a complicated uh, Monte Carlo simulation model that was constructed for a hypotension exposure in terms of time-weighted average of MAP less than 65, and how much of a dollar amount would be achieved when you go from a MAP of 45 all the way up to 65. And as the numbers here on the slide suggest, that maximum dollar amount is somewhere close to four to $5,000 per patient, especially when you're as low as a map of 45 and you want to achieve a map of 65. Again, much work needs to be done in true cost-effective analyses when we look at hypotension exposure, because we have to take into consideration vasopressors, their costs, and those things as well. But just again, based on some early numbers, we do believe that hypotension is not without its associated harms in terms of 
money lost to hospital systems as well. What is the true threshold of hypotension in the ICU? And I know, I know all of you are waiting for uh, some of the more controversial numbers to come up here. So here we go. So 3,000 post-operative patients in the surgical ICU, direct admissions from the operating room to the ICU. And what we saw was that there was a strong quadratic or a nonlinear association of the lowest map on any given day and a primary outcome of myocardial injury and or mortality. We just published this work in critical care medicine and our median here for our entire ICU population was a fairly high map, a map of 87. However, just as an example, a patient who had a lowest map on any given day of 78 versus another patient who has a lower map, lowest map on any given day of uh, 67, the difference right here is an increased, substantially increased risk of nearly about 50% between these two patients of a primary outcome of myocardial injury and or mortality. This work truly tells you that it's not always a map of 65 in the ICU. And I, I will obviously say more numbers that suggest higher blood pressures in the ICU, and there'll be a lot of rebuttal in the end, but what I'm going to stress on is that it's not always a map of 65 in the ICU. The duration seemed to matter. Every hour spent at a map less than 80 and or any duration of map less than 70 seemed to make a strong uh, difference and, and a str had a strong association with primary and secondary outcome. Secondary outcome was acute kidney injury in this study. This was certainly not a, uh, uh, you know, a one-time thing. We had previously seen in a cohort of nearly 9,000 critically ill patients across 110 ICUs in the country where we had determined a single unit of a time-weighted average less than a map of 65 was associated with increased harms, and the harms were about, you know, 10 to 11 percent of uh, association with myocardial injury and mortality, and about 7 percent of an association with acute kidney injury. The interesting part to this work was that this harm started at a map of 85. So a map of 85 is where mortality, AKI, and myocardial injury seem to start increasing in odds ratio. And as, sorry, as we went down, then it was a near stepwise progressive increase in mortality and acute kidney injury and a near stepwise increase in myocardial injury as well. So again, is it a map of 85? I'm not very sure yet, but it's certainly not a map of 65 all the time. This is very early data looking at delirium in the ICU and again, a fairly multifactorial problem, but 75 seems to be the cut point here where below, above and below 75 in the ICU seems to make a difference in delirium as an outcome. And yes, I will say it again and again, delirium is a incredibly complicated problem. And I would never associate delirium with just a single uh, variable like hypotension, but is hypotension one of the major players in delirium? It seems uh, that we do better for our patients when we keep them at a higher blood pressure in the ICU. And I have more data to substantiate that. And this is work from the sepsis BAM investigators themselves that was just published in the Annals of Intensive Care. This is a post hoc analysis of the sepsis BAM trial. And their high blood pressure threshold was again 85 to 90. They achieved better RAS scores, both maximal and minimal RAS scores on days two, day four, and day five in their high blood pressure target group. So they, as they titled it in their paper, there was better brain arousal associated with higher blood pressure in that RCT. Finally, hypotension in the critically ill also happens when we intubate our patients in the ICU. They're usually in a spot of bother when you intubate them, and mostly after intubation, there is a drop in blood pressure. Uh, Nathan Schmishny, who's an investigator from the Mayo Clinic, and myself, we've uh, worked with a large group of investigators across the country where we've collected prospective blood pressure data during hypotension, during, sorry, intubation processes in, in the ICU across about 20 centers. And again, this is unpublished work as yet, 
where we're trying to develop a model that will predict post-intubation hypotension in the ICU. But I'm here to talk about hypotension again and blood pressure thresholds, and we found that a systolic blood pressure of 130 that translated into a MAP of 95 was the cut point above and below which the prediction for post-intubation hypotension would increase or not be associated at all. So pre-intubation blood pressures, again, seem to matter and seem to matter at higher MAPs. Peter Asfar says a MAP of 65 is probably a target of the past. And I can tell you, I was so happy when I read the title of this editorial. This was in response to the work that we had published in 2018 in intensive care medicine. Um, and if you read this editorial, he tells you that, th that a MAP of 65 is not tailor-made for everyone. It's not a one-size-fits-all. He talks a little bit about the limitations of the sepsis PAM trial. It certainly talks about the need to construct another RCT in this space. Again, probably look at other outcomes, but mortality, and probably design it uh, in a way that we can uh, you know, have more granular blood pressure uh, data, so to speak. And again, you know, I, I have said this so many times as, we've, as I've gone on during this talk. Um, I am not advocating for one single number. I'm just saying that a MAP of 65 is certainly not our current blood pressure target in the ICU for all our patients. And then if I look back at all the work that I've presented so far, um, this is my, my little editorial on defending blood pressures in the ICU. I don't think we are quite there yet. And the reason we're not quite there yet is that we don't have good data. And uh, again, uh, what, what data I have today is 9,000 patients in one cohort, 3,000 patients in another cohort, but that data is fairly limited because we have nurse verified blood pressure data. So our monitors pull blood pressure data, continuous beat to beat, unverified data, that data gets purged out, nurses record blood pressure in the EMR. We are dependent on that verified blood pressure data when we pull data and develop all these complicated predictive analytic models and try and develop these associations. In our um, CQ analysis, we had at least one blood pressure reading per hour as a minimum. In the 9,000 patient cohort, we had an exclusion cutoff point of not more than two missing blood pressure readings every five hours. And this, this tells you how much blood pressure data we are missing and just putting in the garbage that we really need to grab and, and use if we really have to develop good outcomes. So lots of numbers today. Uh, this slide will probably summarize <coughs> what I've said and uh, will give you guys food to come back at me after I finish. The yellow bars are target maps, intraoperative. 65, we're all happy with that, I believe, because it's a reasonable number. Um, let me go to critical care where it gets controversial. RAS scores, we look at about 85 as a map. Uh, in general critical care, again, post-operative and otherwise, we're still looking at 80 to 85 as a threshold map. Intubation-associated hypotension, we're looking at systolic of 130, map close to 95. And then coming back to uh, the intraoperative environment, I also talked about systolic of 90 and a diastolic of 45. So a, a lot of uh, numbers that we're not used to, but, and, and I hope in the years to come, uh, we, can pr we can probably provide you more definitive guidelines to, uh, to what blood pressure should be targeted, but I'm also hopeful that some of this work is going to guide or truly guide some of that guideline work that that's going to come and that's going to happen. Hypotension, I will tell you, is a serious situation. I call it a near code situation. I say even short periods are dangerous. I talked about different blood pressure thresholds. Um, and yes, let me go back a slide and say, I, I forgot the floor right here. I don't know what thresholds are important on the floor because we don't have any work as yet. I, guesstimate somewhere between the ICU and the intraoperative environment. That's as good an estimate as, as you guys would have. And really, we don't know. We don't know because we don't know blood pressure in, on the general care floor at all. So hypertension is dangerous, but as, as the two lines in red here suggest right at the bottom, please select a map for your patient, especially in the ICU, and then defend it. 
do not on post-operative day one want a map of 70, post-operative day two, the A-line doesn't look correct, so I'm okay with 65. Day four, your patient's still in the ICU on some pressors. Now you can't get him out of the ICU, so you're like, okay, let's just be okay with 55. Stop the presser, get him out of the ICU. I think that is, and, and I, I, I'm sorry if I, I come out too strong, but I think that is the, that there needs to be more thinking and more deliberation on the harmful effects of hypotension exposure, and we need to be more religious in picking a map threshold and defending it. Whatever we do, intraoperatively in the ICU, the floor, that needs a lot of work. And then, yesterday when I presented this at SOCA, the next speaker was all about perfusion. So I will tell you that we should not forget perfusion. Uh, map by itself probably still doesn't mean anything uh, unless peripheral perfusion or microcirculation is good enough. These are uh, real clips that, that I have recorded as part of the uh, angiotensin II in high output shock trial. And I'll make it easy for you in, in, in the interest of time, but the panel right here is a healthy patient. You can see the dense capillary network, the speeds, speed at which the blood cells are transiting through. This is a patient on high dose vasopressors, a lactate of near 15, you know, the cold, clammy septic shock where there's a lot of microcapillary dropout and uh, you know the blood cells are very sluggish as they are going through. In the real world environment, uh, what I envision is someday you'll have these probes in everyone. You look at them in real time, you titrate your pressors and you titrate everything to a sweet spot. I don't know how long that will take to happen. That day that happens, probably we'll have some better answers as we look at blood pressure thresholds. Very finally, everyone has their own drivers of perfusion. This is my very busy family, my twins and my uh, elder one. They're, they're truly drivers of my cerebral perfusion when I'm at home. And uh, this lady here who keeps them walking in a straight line. I cannot do this. They don't walk in a straight line with me. <laughs> Thanks a lot for your attention. Well, Ashish, thank you for an excellent summary of this complex topic. Is there questions in the audience? All right, Dr. Aksha. <laughs> Just a quick question. Now we have all the data on uh, at least post-operative uh, cardiac events versus acute kidney injury. Do we have any new data on if, when we keep these blood pressures in these goals that we decrease these uh, percentages? So, so, so the question really is, if we, if we are able to achieve these high blood pressure targets, are we able to decrease these events? That, that is an interventional trial that, that we should be doing, and we don't have that data, unfortunately. That, uh, that would probably strengthen my argument again, if I'm able to show that. Yes. Um, Jenny Freeman, um, do you have any uh, information, I, I think at the very beginning, but around how demographics or age or other characteristics impact this, because you know you kind of think that that the uh, the uh, average would be significantly different uh, for you know, in terms of age and other characteristics, right? So for the mimic database, the the, the demographic is was we did have a significant association where increasing age was independently associated with a poor outcome in the ICU, and increasing age was also associated with more hypotension in the ICU. But for all the other work that I've shown so far, we did adequately control for, we were able to adequately control for the uh, age parameter, and we didn't show any independent associations of age. I guess I'm saying the opposite. So can you use age to determine a better threshold for a given individual? Because you'd expect the, you know, the threshold perhaps in a 90-year-old to be 85 and a, and a 20-year-old to be 65. That was my question. With the data you have, can you parse that out? Sure, that, that's a great question. I, I, I would then say that an 85-year-old's uh, blood vessels and their elasticity and probable chronic hypertension would also play into all of that. Um, we, I haven't gotten to those complexities as yet, and uh, all of these are great ideas for future work. I wondered if you had uh, looked at medications that these patients were getting. Was everyone on pressors? Was everyone on propofol? I mean, surely we create some of the hypertension 
Absolutely. Great point. Uh, again, different data sets had, uh, again, I go back to different data sets again. The Mimic data set, everyone was on vasopressors for at least six hours. Um, those vasopressors were adjusted for in terms of norepinephrine equivalents. So everyone is on a similar amount of vasopressors for at least six hours in the final adjusted analyses. So you're looking at hypotension in patients who are on pressors. Yes, in the MIMIC data set that I presented, and I just showed that about up to thirds of our patients are still under a map of 65. It's hard to take that data and apply it to people who aren't on pressors. No, and, and I will tell you that our other analyses, for example, the, the threshold analyses in the ICU I showed, I don't have uh, vasopressor data to, so we controlled for intraoperative hypotension, but we couldn't, we did not control for the amount of vasopressor use in the critical care environment, which is key, as you suggest. You know, a map of 75 on 20 mics of levo is different from a map of 75 on no vasopressors at all. And it, unfortunately, it looks easy, but, uh, you know, Dr. Masha, who helps me or helped me with all of these analyses sitting here in the audience, it is certainly not a, a, as easy or as clean data when you finally start looking at what vasopressor dosages, when were they adjusted, because vasopressor adjustments are also made fairly rapidly in the ICU and both in, in, all, in all directions. So it, it becomes very difficult to control for all of that. Dr. Khan, so uh, one of the things that we looked at at the Cleveland Clinic was also uh, different a couple different interactions with these shapes, the shape of the relationship between, let's say, lowest blood pressure and outcome, say, KI in, in men's. And one of them was, uh, the question came up, what about the patient's baseline blood pressure? If you, if you look at different quartiles of baseline blood pressure, would the shape change and would the threshold that you would recommend change? And I think we found that uh, the shapes you know, where stratify where people came with highest blood pressure were more likely to have a bad outcome, but the shape itself didn't change. It was just shifted up like you might expect uh, because they're sicker. Uh, so that was a case where we didn't find uh, a different threshold for different baseline blood pressure, which is pretty interesting. Um, are there other, other factors that you might, so that's a, I would think that's kind of getting a little bit more personalized medicine, <laughs> saying if I know the patient's characteristics, would I recommend a different threshold for different kinds of patients? So age, maybe one of them, and baseline blood pressure. Are there other factors like that, like that would be known at baseline, or before they get to the surgery that you might think would differentiate uh, the cut cutoffs? Oh, certainly, like, you know, anything like a perioperative or a preoperative, uh, you know, cardiac risk status, you know, recent MIs and things of that nature. I'm sure that plays into how much the, the myocardium is at risk when exposed to a uh, lower blood pressure afterwards. I would say the amount of intraoperative hypotension, certainly something that I didn't talk about in our surgical ICU analyses. We, all of our post-operative outcomes associated with hypotension were cr critically dependent on exposure to intraoperative hypotension. And that would seem to make logical sense. You know, your patient's hypotensive for long durations of time intraoperatively that in itself drives a lot of post-operative uh, organ system injury when your patient goes directly to the ICU from the intraoperative environment. So yes, there, there's, there's a lot of variables that, that again, would come into play and are, are difficult to control uh, or difficult to even know uh, when you do an analysis like that. So these are not confounding variables because we're adjusting for a lot of these things, but like age and everything, so the interaction is to say, should we give everybody the same treatment or not? And I think probably probably not, but I don't know the answer to the, to the question. Yes. Uh, uh, can I go with her first? Yes. Hi. I'm uh, Dr. Peggy Duke from Atlanta, Georgia, Emory, for over 35 years, cardiothoracic anesthesiologist. And I had a, this is a comment, not a question. My rule of thumb was, the mean arterial pressure should be at least the patient's age, whether they were 80 or older, or a little bit above. So if they were 80, I looked for a mean arterial pressure of 80. If they were 90, and we took, I took care of 90-year-olds. You know, I wanted their mean pressure to be 85, 90, and that was my rule of thumb. I like you. <laughs> 
I like you. I want you to sit on the panel with me next year. <laughs> but uh, again, you know, did you apply these rules to cardiac surgery? That's all I did. Okay. Cardi That's interesting because our, all of our data is non-cardiac surgery. Yeah. And, and, you know, sometimes cardiac surgery can get interesting post-operatively because uh, cardiac surgeons would actually want lower pressure, especially when they're trying to protect their valve or, you know, that, their big that, arch surgery. That was the more rare time that you would actually want, you know, that you really were very concerned about that aorta. Right. That was not a common thing. You could easily, and I could convince my surgeons that this patient needed a pressure of 80 or 85, not 70 or 65. Great. Thank you. I actually wanted to ask Dr. Wiener Kronisch's question in a different way from referring to that Foutier study. Do you think that norepinephrine has a role in the results where they had not much of a difference in blood pressures, but patients' outcomes were really different? And there was only one myocardial uh, event, and mostly it's uh, delirium and uh, AKI, I think. Again, uh, why they chose norepinephrine in one arm versus ephedrine in the other arm, I think it's probably for sake of uh, the fact that ephedrine boluses are easier to administer in the uh, operating room environment. I do think that tachycardia associated with norepinephrine would have probably weighed into, um, if anything, if my best guesstimate, it should have been associated with more adverse outcomes. Um, but. I am not certain if it truly made a difference one way or the other. Would, would you have designed this differently? I don't know. I'm puzzled with that study. And uh, we did three journal clubs on it. And uh, in, I had a chance to think about it so many times I couldn't explain. Uh, sure. The other thing is that they didn't really truly define thresholds associated with harm. So I still don't know what low blood pressure threshold was associated with harm. It was simply if you, you know, if the blood pressure dropped below systolic of 80 and then you treated it, that arm didn't do as well as the other arm. But in the end, we don't know those extremes of blood pressure where the harm happened. So I, I myself was, 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 was intrigued, but again, it is an RCT, is an RCT. I want to ask specifically about the general surgical patient who goes to the ward uh, for their first post-op night. Um, how do we know that the, the negative consequences of what we call hypotension during the night um, aren't actually due to the changes of surgery, inflammation, coagulation, and that they've been sleeping with that blood pressure for the last two years and we just now know about it because they happen to be coming into the hospital and they sleep fine all night with a blood pressure, a mean of 55. You guys are asking some wonderful questions. So yes, again, uh, uh, I, I would say if that, that inflammation kicks in post-operatively, that inflammation is probably damaging to the myocardium itself and that increased thrombogenicity in the immediate post-operative period or, or you know, the, the other factors that, that you know, cause more of myocardial coronary thrombosis. All of that does weigh in, but simplistically speaking, if hypotension is one of those things that's driving an adequate perfusion and that's something that we can correct and we're missing, and what I'm advocating for is very simple things simply, just monitor that blood pressure and at least keep your patients in a safe <laughs> blood pressure uh, zone. Now, again, if we do an interventional trial where we continuously monitor everyone on the floor and we give everyone a good blood pressure and, and don't allow any hypotension and still it doesn't make a difference in outcomes, then I'd be convinced that you can sleep with hypotension postoperatively and that and so be it. But again, for the lack of my knowledge and lack of data, I would say I don't know this yet. Thank you again. Excellent.